you've now learned about principal components analysis, but we've uh, mentioned that there's a whole bunch of different ways that we can perform matrix factorization for da data reduction. And just as a brief review, um, in matrix factorization, this process of data reduction, we're going to take a large data matrix and we'll factor it into two smaller matrices, one of which W is going to broadly explain the features of our data set, so the variables, and the other H is broadly going to describe the samples and how those are related to each other. So roughly what these are going to do is separate out variable to variable effects and sample to sample effects. And we saw that with principal components analysis. Also, the benefits of data reduction are many fold. It, for one, just compresses down our data, but it also makes it easier to visualize. If we do it in the right way, we can actually remove noise from our data and make it easier to see patterns. And it's potentially easier to interpret and then finally, we can uh, uh, combine these methods with really any other sort of method that we want to use afterwards, because this is supposed to um, preserve to the greatest extent possible our original data. So I think it's really helpful, even though principal components analysis is by far the most commonly used data reduction method, I think it's really helpful for us to see another form of data reduction to keep in mind that there's a many different ways that we can do this. And depending on the problem that we're interested in solving, um, we might make different decisions about how we do this data reduction. Because again, we're trying to find a data reduction method that matches the kinds of patterns that we see in the data. So, in this module, we're going to talk about a slightly different form called non-negative matrix factorization. You can probably guess uh, how this works from the name. So instead of uh, using orthogonal uh, components like we did in principal components analysis, what we're going to say is that um, all of our input data has to be non-negative, but then each of our matrices is only going to have non-negative values. So they can have some positive value or it can be zero. And this is gonna have two really nice properties. One is potentially it's gonna make it easier for us to see patterns. Um, and then another is gonna be that it actually probably will lead to a lot of zeros in our factored matrices. And this is going to work the same way as we saw with Lasso. So in Lasso, we um, use this regularization. And one of the benefits I mentioned is that most of your beta coefficients end up as zero. And the nice thing about that is when we go and we look at our model, the things that are zero, they're exactly zero. And based on that, we can say, OK, those values have absolutely no effect. So it makes it really easy to focus on what actually matters. If we end up creating a factored form that's mostly zeros, what it means is it can point us directly to what are the parts of the components that we end up with that really matter. <coughs> and the reason we end up with mostly zeros here is because just like when we ran Lasso, one of the things I mentioned with Lasso is if you have your beta coefficients, one of the issues is you might have a really big weighting on beta 1 that increases the value of your output a lot. And then you might have a really large uh, negative coefficient on beta 2 that decreases your output a lot. And the combination of these is exactly the same. You know, they cancel each other out. So the combination of these is much like having just a small weight on beta 1. So if we force everything to be only positive. What it means is if we have our W and H matrix and it's giving rise to this X data, that it's not as though we can make all our values in W or in component one really large and then all of our values in component two really negative and then they would cancel each other out because we can only make things positive. Things are only gonna add together and so if a particular uh, component doesn't matter for uh, a value that we have in X, 
then we're not going to pay the cost of um, putting some value in um, when we add this together. So, you know, um, in a, a normal form, we might have two components, one that is like three times one plus, well, let's say eight times one minus four times one. And this gets us to the right answer because the two values cancel out. But in a non-negative form, we can only have positive numbers. And so if we have a first component that contributes four, then really the only thing we can have is zero in the next component for us to reconstruct the value. So this is the effect that ends up forcing most of the values to be zero. So because the way we're defining success for non-negative matrix factorization is different, the way that we do the solving is gonna be pretty different. So we talked about two different ways to do principal components solving. In non-negative matrix factorization, in fact, there are also many ways that we can solve for the answer here. And uh, NNMF is not defined by a particular way you quantify your reconstruction error. So remember in principal components analysis, the principal components explain the maximum variance. Um, you could define various different types of NNMF depending on how you define your error. For everything we're gonna do today, um, we're gonna minimize the Frobenius norm of our error. And what that means is we're going to take W times H, our reconstruction, minus X. And if we take all of the values in the matrix that we end up with here, and uh, we square them and then we sum them up, the NNMF uh, method that we're going to use is going to minimize um, the, the error that we calculate here. Now you could define error differently and you would end up with a different algorithm and a different solution, but this is the form of NNMF that we're gonna talk about here. So if we're minimizing the Frobenius norm, the method that we're gonna talk about here is called the multiplicative update method. Unlike like in principal components analysis, this method is not going to get us to a globally uh, best solution necessarily. The way that we're going to start out this method is we're going to randomly initialize a W and an H matrix. And remember, um, just like in principal components analysis, we can make those matrices a different size depending on the number of components we want to define. So we'll uh, set W equal to some say random start and h equal to some random start. And then the multiplicative update method is going to locally optimize our values. So it's going to get us to an endpoint that is a better fit to our data, but it's not guaranteed to give us the absolute best method. And the way it's going to work is it's going to iteratively update uh, the H matrix, and then the W matrix, and then the H matrix, and then the W matrix. And you repeat this process until you converge. So this is guaranteed to get to a point where H and W start to change very little. And what you say is something to the effect if H change, if none of the values in H changed more than uh, E to the minus six, then we're done with this process and we have our solution. So the changes that you see are going to get smaller after every iteration, and eventually you'll get to a point where you uh, decide to stop iterating. Now, um, this can look complicated, but I want to separate out a few parts of the process here, and I think that will help to see exactly what's happening. So in both of these update steps, notice um, what n is indicating is the iteration number. And so what we're doing is we're taking H and uh, we're taking the H from our uh, previous iteration. And then the next H that we end up with is simply uh, the H at that individual position. So IJ indicates the position in the H matrix. 
Um, so we take h times some update factor, and that's where you probably guess multiplicative update gets its name. And it's the same process with w. So we take an entry in w, and the updated w is going to be the previous value times some update factor. And the nice property, uh, the nice thing about a multiplicative update is so long as we initialize w and h to be all positive numbers, their sign is never going to change because our update is also always going to be a positive factor. Okay, so now what's going on in this multiplicative update factor? So we have a few parts here. One, notice, is x here. That is the actual data, so the data that we're currently fitting. And then we have two places here where we're looking at the reconstruction of x. Uh, so in both places, we're doing w times h. And that um, is how we define our uh, factorization. So x is supposed to be. Uh, or w times h is supposed to be an approximation of x. OK, so and then the um, last piece we have here is we have the old uh, w matrix or the old h matrix. And roughly what these are doing is they're projecting, um, they're, they're accounting for um, the effect of the other matrix to get re rid of the effect of that other matrix. But the, um, the actual and the reconstructed matrices are really the big part of this um, that we want to think about. So the green highlighted part here we can mostly ignore because this orange highlighted region is really what's going to lead to the multiplicative update. And let's think about this. So if uh, h, the value in this entry of h that we're looking at, is too low, what that means is that x is going to be larger than the wh reconstruction. And so we're going to end up increasing the value of this entry in h. And that's the same thing with the w matrix. If x, let's do the other way around. Let's say that w the value in this matrix is too high, then the uh, x value is going to be lower than the reconstruction. And so the multiplicative update is going to reduce the uh, magnitude of w. And so this is what leads to the multiplicative update system working, is that we are um, multiplying by a factor that if the reconstruction is um, perfect will be equal to one, if it's too small, it'll be greater than one. If it's too large, it'll be less than one. And so it ends up balancing to a, a fit that uh, best reconstructs the data. And again, this only applies for the Frobenius norm, which is an equivalent to uh, the sum of squared error. Um, uh, if you had another sort of error metric, you'd end up with a different method for fitting. Um, but then, uh, Given this de definition of error, we initialize using some method. We can do it with some random values. And then this process will lead to a local fitting. So it'll give us a better fit. It won't necessarily give us the best fit. One last thing I wanted to mention is just, um, just like with principal components analysis, um, at either extreme, we will end up with the same sort of behavior. So if we only have one component, um, we'll have a vector for w and a vector for h. So we'll have a uh, very rough approximation of x. But so long as the values of x are positive, we can end up with a reconstruction that is perfect um, and the way to think about that is uh, we could always have the case where x is equal to x times the identity matrix. So if r is really large, we can perfectly reconstruct x. And then 
we can use the exact same methods that we talked about with principal components analysis to choose how many components we actually want to use. So um, this is really how NNMF works. So the update method is multiplicative instead of additive, and this is what leads to forcing it to be non-negative. The initial values of W and H, we don't know those, and we can randomly initialize them, but they do need to be non-negative. If you set them equal to zero also, multiplying zero by anything isn't going to work, so they do have to be non-negative and um, some sort of positive value. This guarantees a non-negative factorization, and it will converge to a local, local maxima, and therefore the starting point matters. Now again, the way you define this problem is always going to affect the solution you get. So in NNMF, the error metric that you use, how you define whether your reconstruction is good or not is going to matter a lot. Um, the starting point you use is going to matter. And then the fitting method can affect the results that you get. We talked about the multiplicative method. There are other methods. Um, another one would be called coordinate descent which calculates, well, what is the direction that I should move in in changing my values, and then goes through a standard um, optimization approach to solve for a solution. This also converges to a local maxima. Um, but depending on your problem may be a, a better way of solving. OK. so. NNMF especially, I think, benefits from seeing an application where um, this is valuable. Because NNMF, because it's all not positive values, it works particularly well for processes that are additive, meaning that the value of something always increases. Um, it's not decreased ever. Um, and it, it can almost feel like magic when it works. And so I think it's helpful to see an example of this. And this is just a really beautiful example of using non-negative matrix factorization. So we know in cancer that an important part of the disease is that uh, cells accumulate mutations. So they never lose mutations, they accumulate them. And that these mutations are part of what leads to tumorigenesis. And so if we somehow way, had a way of watching a cell over time from its birth well, this in effect would actually be um, multiple cells over time. So let's talk about the organism. We're watching cells in the organism over time. Over time, they're going to accumulate mutations. They're generally not going to lose mutations. And the um, where those mutations occur are, is going to be dependent on the process that gives rise to those mutations. Uh, we know that, for example, um, Sun exposure leads to thymidine dimers, um, and this leads to uh, this leads to a particular pattern of mutations. And what that means is potentially we could take a series of tumors, we could sequence them and look for all of the mutations. So compare to um, a cancer to some sort of germline where we don't expect a lot of those mutations to be present. And then we might be able to find patterns of these mutations. So let's think about what the, how this data would be arranged. So what I'm saying is we'd make a giant table and all of the rows in this table are different tumors. And then the columns here would be something like C, A, G to C, T, G, um, C, C, G to C, T, G. We take every possible um, sequence change and make a row for it. And then if it's present, maybe we put a one there. If it's not present, we put a zero. Or we can also, um, because these may be present at variable lever levels, we'll have um, individual values here. So we could have that a tumor has 50% of a mutation. And by factoring this, what we hope to get 
is a matrix that broadly explains the patterns across the tumors, and then another matrix that broadly explains how these mutational signatures are related to each other. So um, potentially there are processes that lead to certain kinds of sequence changes and not other kinds of sequence changes. And again, because these processes um, are additive, the non-negative um, aspect of this is really important. Okay, so here um, are a few different types of mutational processes, including um, you know, replication damage from methylation. There's this apobec editing, um, and then we have UV irradiation. So this leads to um, pyrimidine dimers, and so it can change C to T in sequences. Um, and this is kind of giving it away, but you can see that each of these has um, particular signatures of those types of mutations. So for example, UV irradiation is almost always a C to T change. And then actually it happens within particular types of sequence context. So what's amazing about this is that you can take that big matrix of just individual tumors. We, we don't tell the data anything about, you know, um, how the, the form of this data, the, the, um, where it came from. It's just a big table of numbers. And then it separates it into these signatures. Um, so we get signatures that are very distinct. And then correspondingly, there will be another uh, matrix that describes the abundance of each of these signatures in a particular tumor. And so you could, for example, look at um, how common a particular signature is in melanoma, say, versus a lung cancer. And this is digging into it a bit more. In this study, they actually break this down a lot in the, the details of the type of mutational signatures that occur. And you can see that the sequence context, so the nucleic acids around the um, the nucleic acid that ends up changed can really strongly affect uh, the uh, abundance of a particular mutational signature. And so this is a, a method that, it, you know, again, it doesn't know anything about the chemical process of this. It only sees this data, and yet it's able to give you a really fine-grained view of um, how these mutational processes happen. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that this only gives us a signature. So we still have to go back then and figure out what sort of process does this represent. So that we saw two forms of matrix factorization, but why you factor these matrices is uh, with the goal of reducing down the data set. Uh, PCA preserves the maximum covariation or the maximum variation within a data set. Um, and the number of components can vary. Often you will use something like two or three components because it's much easier to plot that. NNMF is going to factor your data set into two non-negative matrices. And the benefit of that is that that data is going to end up sparse. So it's mostly going to be zeros. And it's very, very effective for looking at additive factors, processes where the values only increase. That said, there's really an infinite number of different ways that you could reduce down your data. And in order to choose among these different methods, you really have to understand what is the type of pattern that I'm looking for in my data. So again, always what kind of method you pick is going to depend on the question you're asking and how your data is structured. 